Hello, everybody. Uh, a happy Thursday uh, all around the world to everyone that is tuning in. I see some people just starting to trickle into the meeting. So a little bit of housekeeping to get us started here. Uh, many of you have hung out with us before. So if you know the drill already, you can use this time to answer a question for me in the chat. Tell me, what is the distinctive competency of your favorite food? So what makes it stand out from all the other great eats that might otherwise get that top spot? What is your favorite food's distinctive competency? Uh, as you're entering those answers, you should do so in the chat box below. That's the best place for us to hold back channel conversations, chat with peers, swap ideas, et cetera, while Leon is guiding us through this awesome session. Uh, also, just a heads up, make sure that you select everyone from the drop down. Otherwise, it's really just me who can see all your comments. And it makes me feel a little bit selfish to hog all your insights to myself. So make sure you check everyone. If you've got a question for our expert guest, Leon, there is also a Q&A box. Um, and we're going to have a Q&A at the back quarter of our time together today. So use that Q&A box during the session to log your questions. I keep an eye on those and I make sure I flag them for Leon when we have that really interesting QA discussion at the end. Uh, if anyone needs to drop off this session a tad early, I feel so terrible for you because you're going to miss this wonderful stuff, um, but you don't have to stress about it uh, because we are recording this session. You are going to receive a copy of this in your inbox in the coming days. So if you want to share ideas with a peer, we've got you covered. Um, we will have a recording for you. So uh, now that housekeeping is out of the way, Leon, you can pop me to the next slide, please, uh, because now I get to say hello. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Georgina Donahue, the Director of Community here at Pragmatic Institute. One of my absolute favorite parts of my role with this community is being able to connect all of you with brilliant minds and really elevated practitioners that have some super actionable and practical knowledge to share with you. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, events like this one are only really one way that we do that. We also have an online venue space for alumni to exchange ideas, examples, and advice. We've got weekly office hours uh, with our Pragmatic Rockstars, uh, exclusive learning workshops, and honestly, a truly enormous collection of resources. So I do hope that you join us uh, in Pragmatic's alumni community. I am ready for the next slide, please. And I am so ready to move into this discussion. Uh, we're gonna have a really great time today talking about how you can uncover your product and your organization's distinctive competencies. Because really one of the largest struggles in any product is just articulating what your unique abilities are to deliver value to your market. And guess what? It's also one of the most critical pieces. So today we're really gonna chew through that. We are going to discuss how you can find your distinctive competencies and turn them into assets, how you use marketing as a top asset when telling your story, and also, of course, why data is a really key factor in your entire process. And so here with us, um, we are lucky enough uh, to learn from my good friend, Leon. Uh, Leon Sticker is a senior technical product manager at Amazon Web Services. He's got tons of years of experience in the product sphere, and he's incredibly passionate about creating data-driven product strategies. I give you a money-back guarantee. You will agree with me on that one by the end of this session. Um, in his most recent position, Leon has been helping developers become really more connected with data sources and analytical tools uh, that help transform data into really powerful product insights, something that I know that we all aspire towards. Um, he also happens to be an incredibly generous and active member of Pragmatic's alumni community. So uh, it's my total delight to have him here with us today. Um, so that's more than enough from me because I want Leon to have all of the airtime. Leon, thank you for being with us and welcome. Well, first off, thank you so much for for that introduction. And uh, based on based on your your question earlier, can I just call out uh, Karen Weisblad? I, and I do apologize if I mispronounce your last name, Karen. But your answer absolutely won it for me. Uh, her answer on what the, uh, the the most distinctive competency is for food is prepared by someone other than me. Um, I would I would have to agree with that. I mean that that absolutely won it. Um, yeah, no, absolutely love it, love it, Karen. Uh, so, 
you know, I I also wanted to say, uh, first up, thank you for having me. It's it's great to see so many people here for the July product, uh, pragmatic product chat. And you know, as we as we start off, I I wanted to have a quick disclaimer here um, that the opinions and the experiences that I'm going to share in this presentation are my own, and they may not reflect those of other people that I work with or of the organizations that I work with. They truly are mine. Now that now that we've got that covered, today actually is really special because first of all, today is National Hamburger Day. So as we talked about food, um, I I wanted to just call out that if you if you wanted to go for lunch or dinner, maybe hamburger since today's National Hamburger Day. And some sources say that it was invented by Louis Lassen in uh, Connecticut on July 28, in 1900. That's why we celebrate it uh, today. Now, it is also National Water Park Day and created by a company a lot later in 2017, to be honest. Um, so fun fact for the people here that are from the US with over a thousand water parks, the United States has more water parks than any other country, which I thought was fascinating. Um, Oh, that is actually really awesome. I'm also reading a chat. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll probably, I shouldn't be doing that. But Dave said he worked at, uh, at a company where the Big Mac was created, which I thought was, was fascinating. Um, and the third reason why today is special is that today is my first pragmatic product, Jen. And I, as you can see, I'm super excited uh, to, uh, to, to be here. Now, let's, let's begin. And I want to take you on a bit of a journey because that that sort of explains why why specifically this this box within the pragmatic framework that we're talking about is is so important to me. And obviously, every story needs a really good origin. So you know, let's let's just uh, let's just start with that. And. The origin for this story starts in, in 2016, on, on February 9th, to be exact, as I got into an elevator of a, of a New York City hotel from the 50-something floor, went down to the third floor to, to take a course. Now, I had just moved to the United States, and I had just become a product manager at a company called uh, called Tipco Software. And uh, they went private thanks to Vista Equity Partners. And that meant that all product managers had to take a specific training course. And that training course was from Pragmatic Marketing. Now, as a brand new PM, you can imagine that I was a little skeptical on, on how that would work out. But you know, I was in the concrete jungle where dreams are made. So I thought to myself, I'll, I'll let myself be surprised. And at that point, this person starts talking, Mark Stiving, and he not only changed my perception on the company pragmatic, but also on like the simple, and I'm definitely using air quotes here, things like, how can you find the right problems to solve? And his advice stayed with me throughout all the different roles in my career. And that is why it is so incredibly important to me. Now, I totally get that you're thinking, so who are you again? And that is an incredibly valid question. So uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Daniel Stichter. I've had a bunch of different roles throughout my career, like product manager, like developer advocate at some of the amazing companies. And the things that I learned from Pragmatic have always been relevant to me in whatever role. Now, in my personal life, I'm on a mission to taste cheesecake in every city that I visit. So if you have any suggestions, please feel free to send them here in the chat. Send me a DM on, uh, on Twitter or, you know, any, any of those, uh, the, those great resources. But having said that, enough about me. And let's get started with the pragmatic framework, the thing that every product manager has having, uh, is having above their bed or perhaps it's only just me. And specifically, I wanna talk about the distinctive competencies. And I wanna focus on that first word first, like distinctive. What, is, what does it mean to have distinctive competencies? And as we dive in, there are two types of competencies that, that we see. At the one hand, you have the core competencies, which are essentially your, your defining strengths that are central to your value generating activities. And I think that 
value generating is an incredibly important aspect there. Value isn't just about, you know, the money that you charge for a product. Um, it's also about making the life of your users of your product a lot better. And as we think about value generating, it hopefully changes the way that we think about roadmaps as we go to more outcome driven, which essentially generates the value. Now, that second type of competency is your distinctive competency. These are definitely core competences as well, because they are very much important to what you do, but they are the ones that set you apart from the market. Now, let's dive into that, uh, that first one first. Let's talk a bit about your core competencies. So as I said, they are your defining strengths central to the value generating activities that you have. And um, essentially, there are two key components to it. First off, it's a skill or capability and not an owned resource. So like the amazing office that your company has somewhere is probably not a core competence. Second, it plays a prominent role in helping your company achieve its purpose. And that word purpose is going to come back a few times later on as you start to think about what are uh, your, your distinctive competencies. So think about, think about purpose. Now, two examples of, uh, of core competences would be roasting coffee, uh, you know, insert your favorite coffee place. It is definitely a skill and it definitely helps them achieve their purpose. But is it, is it going to set them apart from the other, uh, the other coffee places? Uh, another would be payroll processing. Um, you know, think about a company like, like ADP. Is payroll processing per se distinctive to them? Is that what sets them apart from the rest of the market? And, you know, to be honest, I, I don't think it, it really is. And I'll come back to that, to that specific example in, uh, in a bit. Now, the other type of competence are distinctive competencies. And as I said, they are absolutely your core competences. So that those first two, uh, two bullet points that were, were on the previous slide are on this one as well. Um, but these are ones that really set you apart from your competition. And that means that they have to be visible to your customers. I mean, let's be honest, if they're not visible, then who would know that you are the better choice for the problem to solve? Um, it should also be very hard to imitate because otherwise in a few weeks or maybe a few months, if you're lucky, you're going to go back to square one and have to figure all this out again. So let's talk about coffee roasting for a sec. I mean, as I talked about, it's definitely a skill. It helps achieve the, uh, the purpose of the company. And while it, or at least the result, uh, you know, is visible, it's not exactly rocket science to roast, com uh, to roast coffee. There are a bunch of companies that, uh, that do it. Now, customer intimacy, on the other hand, which a lot of those, uh, those coffee places have, is starting to get much more towards a distinctive competency. Um, also one that they measure a lot. So for measuring leads to data, leads to things that you can do with it. Um, and that is why that is such an important thing. Now, taking an example from a completely different industry that has nothing to do with, with IT or coffee roasting, to be honest, um, one of the companies that I, that I absolutely admire is Toyota. And Toyota has a distinctive competency in lean manufacturing. I mean, they created things like, like Kanban, for example. And they have core competencies in building a lot of things like cars and, you know, all those amazing things that make our lives a lot easier. But all of their processes are, are essentially driven by the idea of lean manufacturing. And let's just walk through that, uh, through that checklist. Is it, a skill or, uh, is it a skill or capability? I, I would say it is. It, does it play a prominent role in the company's purpose? I would say it does. Is it visible to, uh, to the customer? Absolutely. I mean, the result of what they do with it is definitely visible. I mean, at least if I look in the garage beneath my apartment complex, I can see the end result. Um, and it is incredibly hard to imitate. And companies are, are trying, but it is incredibly hard to do lean manufacturing the way that Toyota does. Now, as we dive into more of my own experiences, I definitely want to give a shout out to one of the projects that I used to work on called Project Logo.
Project Flogo was created by, by TIPCO, you know, the company where I started my origin story. And TIPCO is known for its integration software. Now, building integration software is, is a hard thing to do. And the idea behind Project Flogo was to create a resource-efficient, Go-based, open-source ecosystem for building event-driven apps. What truly sets it apart is that one engine, one, one like software thing can do integration. So connecting sources together, it can do complex event processing. So reacting to things that happen or don't happen. It can be an API gateway, um, validating that the input you send into your APIs is actually correct. And it can do streams processing. And as we, at least in the IT industry, get much more towards the edge with smart devices, processing things on devices is, is becoming incredibly important. So being able to do that with the exact same building blocks, no matter what type of app you're building, is an incredibly important advantage. Um, so think about those building blocks like validating an API key if you're on that, that API gateway side. Think about calculating, uh, uh, calculating averages across sliding time windows, which is, which is very hard. Now, having a, uh, having a way to have all those building blocks behave exactly the same way across all of those uh, different, uh, different ways to build applications is incredibly hard to imitate. Now, I have to admit that the designer of the logo did an epic job creating that cute little hummingbird. And that hummingbird actually embodies some of the distinctive competencies that that logo has. Hummingbirds, um, as you may or may not know, are incredibly nimble and they're really, really small. They're some of the smallest birds on, on the earth. Um, so that really plays into the idea of being resource efficient, being super tiny, but they're also one of the few, if not the only bird that can actually fly backwards. Now, to be honest, I've never seen a hummingbird do that. So I've only read it on the internet. Um, so you'll, you'll have to either believe me or look it up. Um, and if you look at, at one of the core uh, and distinctive competencies that Flogo has, it has a, what no other product has. It has a step back debugger. So that means that as a developer, as you're building those applications, you can actually go back in time as you're debugging. And that is one of those amazing things that, you know, have helped talk to developers uh, and potential customers alike. So just going over, uh, over, the, over that checklist really quick, uh, for step back debugger in this case, is it a skill or capability? Absolutely. Is it a prominent role in uh, the company's purpose? Well, in this case, the project's purpose or product's purpose. Is it visible to the customer? Well, definitely. And is it hard to imitate? Incredibly. There is, in fact, a, a patent, and I'm not sure if it was already issued or if it's still pending, specifically about this capability. Now, as we start talking about all of those competencies, I, I've mentioned the word data a bunch of times. So why does data matter? What, because we, we need to start measuring things. And like the title of John Doerr's best-selling book, Measure What Matters. Now, one of my all-time favorite quotes is actually one that you'll recognize from the Pragmatic Institute slides if you've taken any of their courses. And uh, you know, it also says, oh, you can actually, oh, you can, you can sort of see. It also says it on my coffee mug, uh, simply because I, I do very much value that. Um, by the way, I, I, I want to ask a pragmatic team so I can attribute it to the correct person next time. Who was it that, that said this? I believe that is the founder, Craig Stoll. Ah, okay, awesome. I'll make sure that next time I talk about this, I'll, I'll include his name. Thank you. Now, the most important th fact, obviously, here is that they're not saying that your ideas don't matter. What they're saying, or at least the way how I interpreted it, is that you need to validate your ideas as you're working on, uh, on your competencies. And you want to measure the output. You want to measure the value. Now, data absolutely matters. And quite frankly, it doesn't really matter where the data comes from, as long as you know why you want to use the data, why are you measuring that specific thing, and also account for potential biases. You want to make sure that you know 
that you uh, that you understand that your data can be colored by the fact of the people who you ask or the places where you where you go uh, go find that data. So places where at least I have looked in the past to to go find uh, go find data for my uh, for my competencies are, are blogs and documents. Like who's reading a specific blog post? Who's reading the docs that we put out on on new features or, or parts that we consider the things that set us apart? As you as you start to figure out who those people are, you can actually go ask them. Um, you can use market research, not only to get to the literal answer of what sets us apart from the competition, but also things like, what do people really care about? What are the problems that they see with current solutions? And maybe even what are the problems that they see with our solution? And especially market research, if you do that with some of those uh, market analyst firms that exist, then you get a hopefully not as biased uh, response. And that makes it easier to interpret that data and start using it for all of the stuff that, uh, that we're talking about. Now, if you have a developer type product, then I would say absolutely leverage your, your advocacy team or depending on how, how you want to call it, the team that actually talks to developers and brings back the feedback into your, uh, into your company. They have an amazing insight into what communities value, what they think of, and what you should do better, but also what sets you apart. And last but not least, and obviously take the results that you get from this one with a bit of a grain of salt, but use social media. Uh, Twitter, Reddit, um, maybe your own uh, you know, social media platforms really help understand what people want to do, what matters for people. Now, coming back to Flogo for a second, uh, where we just talked about all those amazing distinctive competencies and distinctive capabilities, they don't matter if you cannot share how they're impacting the user. And I've listed some of the things that were really important to, uh, to developers and to the people that we were talking to, resource efficient. And I know that sounds cool. But it's really awesome if you know that it's a lot lighter, like 20 to 50 times lighter than a comparable Java or Node.js app. Open source sounds incredibly cool, but it's really nice when you know there are loads of developers using it to build applications and contribute those new building blocks to your community. One of the, one of the reports I created every Monday morning actually using Flogo to go do that was how many new, how many distinct um, uh, building blocks were created over the past week. And we could actually see an increase in, uh, in usage. And that is amazing. Now, those different types of apps, are those that sounds absolutely cool. Um, but, you know, it's, it really stands out when you know that you can take that same application you have and deploy that as a serverless function, as a container on top of Kubernetes or literally on an IoT device that is running on the edge. Now, having the data to know that, to, to prove that, and to show to your potential customers is beyond important, at least to me it is. Now, let me, let me give you another example of, of a product that I helped build. And I want to talk about, about Calyx. Um, Calyx, and I'm going to guess not a lot of people uh, know this, but it's a developer platform for highly scalable real-time applications that essentially focus on eliminating the overhead and challenges of maintaining infrastructure and databases. So as a developer, it lets you choose how you want to store the data, um, like, do I want key value stores? Do I want something that's a bit more relational? Um, without the, the need to do any of the database management, to do any of the database maintenance. Now, as I talked about that, for a lot of people, including developers, including, uh, you know, people that are, are listening to this and go like, okay, that sounds kind of cool, but isn't that like a drastic shift from what we've done in the past? Absolutely. It is a radically different concept from most developer platforms that I have seen at least. And that meant that we, uh, as like the entire engineering product and marketing teams needed to educate the market. And that means that you need to prove 
um, how fast you can actually be productive, how fast you can deploy, how easy it is to take away some of those challenges. Now, for a lot of developer platforms out there, that means that the time to first Hello World, because Hello World, who doesn't know it, is, is just one of those incredibly important metrics. How fast can you get something up and running that's actually meaningful? Um, because that, that literally shows how fast you can go to, uh, to be productive, how fast you can start to innovate for your own company. Now, for, for Calix, as I said, being such a different platform, it was an incredibly important aspect of what we did, of who we were. And while it took some time for, for developers to grasp all the nitty gritty details, they, uh, what we saw is they did definitely deployed their first service faster than we thought was possible. Now, to actually go measure that, we literally measured everything. We measured when they signed up. We measured uh, when they first deployed their service. We measured uh, or we looked at which programming language they were using. And obviously, we made sure to protect privacy because even though that data is important, protecting privacy is definitely one of those things that you want to be looking at as well. Uh, we also looked at, are they using command line tools that we put out or are, are they using the web API? Now, all of that data, all of those metrics, all of the things that we measured ultimately drove the outcomes that we put into our roadmap. And that means that our roadmap was much more outcome based. And why talk about outcome based roadmaps in, in the first place? I mean, aren't roadmaps just placeholders for the new features that you're building? Well, yes, but then that's obviously code for perhaps, but not really. Your roadmap should capture the problems that you're trying to solve. And, you know, to speak with, uh, with pragmatic uh, uh, words, they're the ones that the market wants to pay for. Um, the things that you put on your roadmap are outcomes. The outcomes, they are measurable. They are the measurable impacts that you want to create for your customers. And those are things, those could be internal things as well, like increasing your market share, reducing your, your technical debt. Essentially, what it comes down to is that your outcome-based roadmap captures the value. And value is, is in the benefits that you deliver to, uh, to customers through the, the features that we build and you know, the business impact that you create when customers engage with, uh, with your product. Value is, is essentially what you measure uh, by not only what uh, customers want or desire, which are ultimately your problem-oriented features, but also looking at the metrics, the data that you need in order to, uh, to understand whether or not your business is successful. Now, to deliver value, you want to be focusing on like the important, simple things that is going to delight your customer. And I, I think I saw um, in one of those, uh, one of the chat messages, someone talking about delighting a customer. And that is absolutely true. Uh, so when you combine all of those things, when you combine the problem oriented features with the need to be distinctive, you get to innovation. And those can be really small leaps like literally uh, making a feature just 10% better, or those can be massive new product launches. And I want to think about uh, at least one of, one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite companies, uh, Apple. And arguably they have done an amazing amount of innovation and they have a, a large number of distinctive competencies. Now, think a moment when their roadmap said, look, we've already put a gazillion songs into your pocket by using things like the iPod. Now we're going to add a calculator. We're going to add a computer. We're going to add a gaming device. And we're going to all do that in the exact same device. So they went with an outcome. They used their, their innovating capabilities. They used that to create a very, at least to me, very successful distinctive competency. And that is all great. You know, when you know your distinctive competencies, that is super useful. But, but what if you don't? What if you are just starting out with a product? What if you are having trouble understanding what sets you apart from, uh, from the rest? Where can you go and look? And as it turns out, you can relatively easily start looking at your mission and vision. 
you know, the reason that your company exists, the reason that you're bringing value into the world, that is absolutely unique. At least I don't think I've ever seen two companies with exactly the same mission. Now, products may be similar, but the reason why a company or why a product exists usually isn't. So I want to, uh, I actually want to do some uh, b- bit of a, a bit, bit of an experiment, bit of a, um, uh, a, b- a bit of a game. So I'm going to put a statement on the um, uh, on, on the slide right here. Uh, I'm not going to read it out just yet. And what I'd love for you to do is like spend 15, 30 seconds to think about which company is this. So the statement is to inspire and uh, nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. Anyone want to guess which company it is? Yes, ab- absolutely. I see a bunch of correct answers coming by. I don't think I've seen a wrong answer yet. These guys which, are so which smart obviously is- today. They nailed oh, it. Absolutely. This is this is amazing. Um, for everyone that said Starbucks, you're absolutely correct. This is Starbucks. Um, okay, so you know, let's let's do another one, maybe one that is slightly more difficult. So completely different industry as well. Providing solutions that simplify work. Anyone? Okay, workday. I, I like it. I like it. Salesforce could be Slack. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Asana, I, I could see how, how they could use that as well. Yeah, I can see Microsoft and, and AHA, Atlassian, Citrix. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely see all those companies using, uh, using this statement. Uh, Charles, however, was the first one that got it right. It is indeed ADP. Um, so, you know, the, the thing is that, and this is sort of going back to one of the, one of the earlier slides, uh, just providing payroll is not really a distinctive competency. Now, the distinctiveness for, for ADP could definitely lie in taking that complete solution, taking all those challenges of the areas of, of human capital management, bringing that together in, in one single place. Now, that's definitely a capability. That is definitely helping achieve their purpose. And if you've used ADP's technology, it cannot be more visible to, uh, to customers. And it is also incredibly hard to imitate because bringing all of that together is not an easy task. Now, rent recognition, and that is especially true for the previous one for, for Starbucks, is, is one of those valuable assets when it comes to distinctive competencies. Staying within your company, though, go ask your colleagues, go ask your employees, why are you at my company? Now, I'm willing to bet that the main reason is not that they like the color of your logo. If they are, that's also totally okay. Uh, I don't want to discourage anyone's logo color. Uh, But they are at your company because they believe in what you do. They believe in your vision, the mission that we just talked about. They love your brand because they deeply care about the impact that you make. They've joined your company to make that impact and to see when their product and when their beliefs actually make that change that they want to see possible. That is, that is one of those core moments that you want to capture. Now, granted, having people that are so passionate about what they do also helps improve the quality of your product. And those are competencies that really set you apart. Especially in more technology-oriented companies, your employees also likely know what and how the other products you compete with work and you know, how they are different. Now, granted, this is all asking within. This is looking at you know, the, the founders, the CEO who've created that vision and that mission. This is asking your, your colleagues, your employees, why they are at your company. But in the same spirit, you can actually go ask your customers, your prospects, like, why are they looking at your products? Why do they, why do they really care about the problem that they're trying to solve? And why do they look towards your company? Now, speaking of customers, do they belong to a specific group? So think back about the pragmatic talks that the pragmatic, um, I think it was marketing that really talks about the market segments and, you know, solving things for a specific niche. If you are serving a specific group of people that really chooses your product above all else, 
that's a distinctive competency that sets you apart from literally everyone else. And if that all get, if all those things give you the distinctive competencies that you need, great. If not, then talking to all those people are amazing inputs to go brainstorm. Think about all the attributes where your company delivers value and whether they are materially different from your competitors. Now, you've done the market research. You know that there's a problem in the industry today that you're solving. You found the urgent and pervasive problem that people are willing to pay for. Now, the question is, what is your proof? What is the proof that anyone actually cares about that specific value? And knowing the answer to that question is fundamentally important when you're going to tell your story. Is it different or is it unique? And again, knowing the answer to that is really important when you go tell your story. So how to brainstorm for success? And because everyone at any company has a different view on what it means to be distinctive. I mean, I saw some amazing questions in the chat, some amazing comments as well. I absolutely recommend getting, uh, getting at least the, uh, the stakeholders or representatives of the teams or however you want to call that in a room to start discussing. Now, make sure that you have representatives from your engineering team. They've built the product that you have representatives from your product management team, because hopefully they've listened to the, to the customers, from your product marketing team, because they've talked to the market, they've gathered that feedback. But also, and I think this is really important, go listen to your sales teams. They need to sell the product. They are going to be in front of your customers, explaining why your product is so much different, so much better than anything else. And in all honesty, and maybe this is a bit biased by the fact that I was a developer advocate, but if you uh, have a developer-focused product, I think your developer advocate should be part of this as well. So one of the one of the more successful ways I've seen this happen is get everyone into into a room, either you know virtually using things like Zoom or uh, or if you're back into the office, get everyone into into the same room and have have them spend fifteen to twenty minutes just write down competencies that they think are either core or distinctive. Um, after that. Have people put things on a whiteboard. And yes, I do absolutely love a whiteboard, whether that is a virtual whiteboard using some of the technologies I saw scrolling by in, in the chat, or you know, an actual whiteboard. Um, and start to group them into clusters. And from there, start discussing the questions that we had on the previous slide. Does anyone actually care? And uh, you know, is it is it really, really different? And especially for products or companies that are in a market with a lot of competitors, those two questions are super important. And now that means that it's also really important to have all the stakeholders in the room because they hopefully know what sets you apart, or at least you can gather enough input. Now, to me, though, the most important thing is always to make sure that you're creating a psychologically safe space to do this. Don't let the loudest voices or the most senior folks dominate the conversation. Make sure that everyone's voice is heard. So now that you've listed down some of those, uh, those competencies, how do you tell your story? How do you make sure that someone is actually going to listen to what you have to say? And I want to go back to one of the very first pragmatic lessons that, uh, that, that I got, because there is a problem in the industry today. And, you know, I'm not talking about the problem that generations after us won't know that the save icon is the way that it is, or that I cannot use beef stew as a password because it isn't stroganoff. Okay, I was sort of hoping that everyone started laughing here. Um, what I'm obviously talking about here is that this is the positioning statement for, for our products. And th thank you, Dave. I, I appreciate it. Um, the story that we're going to tell has to start with a problem. It has to start with the reason why anyone would open a web browser, why anyone would uh, go search or, or look on social media sites to solve that problem, to solve, to scratch that itch that they have. And that means it has to start with a problem that is urgent, pervasive, and that people are willing to pay for. Um, you know, that is the stuff that uh, Pragmatic really, really nails into every conversation that you have. And that's, that's super awesome. But that's only half the puzzle. 
now that we know that we have a solution to the problem that people have, we need to get the markets to actually pay for it. And to do that, we need to make sure that the market knows that we exist and that they know that we solve their problem. And to make sure that we do that for persona, product name, for a problem by, for a primary benefit. And um, okay, I'll try to do that in less cryptic terms. And uh, Georgina, I borrowed this one from the Pragmatic Alumni Community, which as you said, has some amazing resources out there for product managers product minder manages the product requirements without all the paperwork so that they can stay focused on the business and the market needs while keeping your stakeholders informed and in sync. Now that captures a lot of things. That captures why does it exist? What is unique? Why, why do you, uh, you know, why should a user care? So that statement is really, really powerful. And that is something that every single individual within your company can take to your customer and go use to sell your product right but and i again want to do sort of a sort of a scenario here have you ever been in this scenario so you're about to buy a car and at least from me talking to other folks there are a lot of people that don't actually enjoy going to a car dealership now i want to spend the next 30 to 45 seconds just learning from you all if, you, if this applies to you, and if so, what, what were the specific reasons why you don't like going to a car dealership? So if you could put that into the chat, that would be super awesome. <laughs> Salespeople pushing, yeah. Try to upsell, high pressure, yeah. People in general, okay, that's fair. Got research as well, high pressure sales tactics, the price is not the price. Not always the source of truth. That's an interesting one. Lack of transparency. That's an interesting one. They can be fake and manipulative. Oh, that's that's a really really good one. Uh, close the deal at at all cost. Time. You know that's that's a very good one. Not trustworthy. I I actually want to Fernando. That's a really good one, and I I want to sort of zoom in on that. Because I think that the truth is, and, and let me agree, let, let me know if you people agree with this or not, is that a lot of people don't feel hurt. Most people think that these people are selling you the car, but they don't really want to listen to what your actual requirements are. And I saw a lot of answers that said something of the sorts. And to give you a personal example, um, my wife and I uh, had a, a son about six and a half months ago. So we started shopping for, for a new car. And sales folks, they usually started asking, hey, do you want a cool sports model or two-seater convertible? Uh, you know, all those, those cool um, th those cool things that, thank you, I appreciate it, Marianne. Uh, all those cool things that are, um, are generally associated with, with buying a new car. And I probably really would have liked it, to be honest, but we started shopping because we were expecting. We, we needed a bigger car to fit all those other things that we needed to bring, like strollers and all the, uh, all the good stuff. So they weren't really listening to my problem. And okay, so that was, that was a fun experience and we obviously wanted to do it better. But who owns telling that story? Who owns telling a story to the market? Now, I love to get some ideas of where stories for your companies come from and, and like who owns them. So if you could put that into the chat, that, that would be great as well. And I'll at least give you, give you my idea about where those stories come from because I don't think that uh, Unihito visits, great one, love it. Uh, I don't think that any of those, any of the, the teams here is really owning the story that you tell the market. Uh, because all those teams need to be working together in order for you to make a, a very compelling, successful story. So, you know what, let's, let's actually go do, uh, go do another scenario. Um, so, Think about this, you're the product manager for a brand new product that's just about to launch and you've done the research so you know that the market has an urgent pervasive problem, they are willing to pay for it to solve. And then your VP of sales calls and says, hey, um, by the way, why, why is our customer going to care about this again? And is that a problem that is owned by the marketing team? Maybe. 
Is that a problem owned by the product team? Maybe. Now, I had and have the pleasure of working with some epic product marketers that have been able to take those things that we've spoken to, uh, spoken about, and put them into a, co a cohesive story. But telling a story is hard. Uh, and it turns out that there is a process that is called command of the message, and it's created by a company called Force Management. They have this mantra, and as it turns out, that if you take all the things that we've been talking about for the last 40-ish minutes or so, and you put them in the right order, that you're showing a true understanding of your customer's problem, you're showing a true understanding that you've been willing to listen to them, and you can add all of those distinctive competencies and why they matter. Now, granted, it will take a few conversations with those customers before you can summarize it like this, but the mantra goes a bit like this. What I hear you say, dear customer, is that these are the primary benefits that you're trying to achieve. And uh, in order to, uh, to, to achieve these, these outcomes, we agreed that you want to have these problem-oriented features within the product. Now, you're going to measure them. You probably want to measure them using, uh, using these metrics. And up to that point, we've listened to the market. We've listened to, uh, to why they want to buy your product. We've listened to uh, or we've, we've agreed with them why our product is, is so super useful because, you know, those are the problem-oriented features. Um, and now you, you sort of earned the right to go talk about yourself. Let me tell you how we do it. Let me tell you how we do it better or differently. And then ultimately, you know, you don't want to take my word for it. You can, you can ask someone else. And these are absolutely the places uh, where your distinctive competencies fit in. So let me, let me try one. And as I'm reading through this, I'll pause every time. Um, we're going to do one of these, one of those committed messages, and see if you can guess which product it is. Okay. So what I hear you saying, dear product uh, or product marketing manager, is that you constantly want to learn, take your skills to the next level, and connect with peers all over the world. Okay. Pragmatic Institute, LinkedIn, Pragmatic, okay. In order to achieve these positive outcomes, we agreed that you're gonna need a private LinkedIn group, uh, office hours with real instructors and a safe place to ask your questions. So pragmatic is probably correct. Uh, I see someone saying pragmatic community and you know that to be honest was exactly what I was looking for. So let me, let me finish just slightly, uh, slightly faster. Uh, so you probably want to measure these using metrics like the number of instructors that are part of the community, uh, the number of peers that give presentations, and the speed at which your questions are answered. Now, let me tell you how we do it. Our product was designed so that you never had to start from scratch. This, the space that we offer is full of like-minded product professionals from around the world and across industries, including the seasoned instructors that we have. And of course, all of the course materials that we have within product, uh, within Pragmatic Institute are available there as well. Now, let me tell you how we do it differently because all of the users that are part of our community, they have been in your shoes before. They are ready to share their tips, tricks, and tools that they've used to turn their training into real results. And that includes all of our instructors who have built companies and built products, and they want to share their tips and tricks and also learn from, uh, from you. But don't take my word for it. Ask the thousands of PMs and PMMs around the world that have never stopped learning after they have joined the Pragmatic Alumni community. So as we talk about, as we rethink all the things that we've talked about before, these are literally the things that you put into this story. You have a bunch of, a bunch of features, if you will, pro problem-oriented features that, um, that you want to highlight. You have a bunch of, a bunch of reasons why, you know, why, why people are thinking about your product but there are more features, very important reasons that set you really apart. And in this case, the distinctive competency was all in that, let me tell you how we do it differently part, because all of the users that are in pragmatic in the pragmatic alumni community, they have been through what, what everyone is going through the first time that, that they take a training. 
um, you know, everyone is ready to share their tips and tricks. I, I cannot imagine having to take all the things I've learned and having to do it from scratch every time. I'm incredibly grateful to be part of such an amazing community. So to recap what we've talked about today, we've talked about why it matters that we have distinctive competencies. And the answer is obviously um, to answer why you're different from your competitors. Uh, they are the things that are visible to uh, to your customers so that they know that you are the better choice. We've talked about why data matters, because without data, it's like we're driving a car on the highway, wondering if we still have enough fuel left to actually make the trip. Um, data helps us make those informed decisions on how we're doing and helps us set the metrics that we can show to potential customers. We've talked about finding those distinctive competencies, both within and outside of your company. And we ended with how to tell that story in a way that earns trust, because it shows that you've listened uh, to, uh, to the other person. So, Georgina, I believe this one's for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am just still still in awe um, of all of that wonderful, um, awesome stuff. So now, guys, this is the this is your time to ask questions. Um, there are a couple questions in the QA box already, um, and uh, I have gotten some um, directly as well that I will keep an eye on and will ask. But while you're entering uh, your questions, um, I'm going to uh, give you a uh, a little preview of the conversation that we're going to have here next month. Um, our next Next product chat on August 25th, um, we are going to talk to Andrew Peterson. He's the founder of Closed, um, and we're going to talk about how to really optimize your win-loss efforts um, and so that you can uh, win more and lose less, right? That's the whole, that's the whole goal. Um, so that, that does sound like a good idea. Yeah. That's that's the plan that we came up with. We think that that's going to be um, that's going to be a hit. Um, so, anyways, uh, please please do join us uh, for that. Um, all right, I've got a couple questions for you here, Leon, um, and I assume we're going to have a couple more coming in. Um, so let's dive right into it. One really good question uh, is about distinctive competencies versus visions. Um, how is a distinctive competency different from your vision or your mission statement? Um, it's a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that's that's a great question. And it it lies sort of in the in the reason why those two different things exist as as two different things. The the vision and the mission are essentially very forward looking things. This is where I want to be. Um, you know, if I, if I look at, at my son, this is who I want to be when I grow up, you know, that, those kinds of things. The distinctive competencies, they have to exist right now. They have to exist because that is how you tell the story to people that want to buy your product. Now, some people absolutely want to learn about your vision, your mission for the product or for the entire company before they, they buy the product. But ultimately, your distinctive competency is what draws people in, because that is what makes you different in solving the problem that they have today. Awesome. I love that. Thank you. Um, then we have a question. You were chatting a little bit about um, getting a lot of voices in the conversation about unique attributes. And so there's a question here about how do you ensure that you're really gathering and counting all of those voices and not just the really loud ones or, you know, the, um, the classically important um, people um, in those types of meetings? Do you have any kind of strategies or ways that have worked for you? So one of the one of the ways that worked for uh, really worked for us, uh, or at least in you know the sessions that that I've been in, is let the most senior folks go last, especially when when you want to make sure that more junior folks have um, have a way to really capture their own ideas and not just write the things that someone else says. Make sure that they go last. Um, you know, if, if you have the CEO, the, the VP of product and uh, uh, all the way down to, uh, to like the, the new engineer or the interns that literally just joined your company, just make sure that they go first. Let them share why, why they think the product is so different first. That's a great idea. I feel like it relieves so much pressure too. You feel a little bit nervous to say something like, oh, they must've had the right answer um, if they go first. So super, really, really simple. I love that. 
Uh, we have another question from Marianne that's also about uh, moving towards simplicity. Uh, how important do you think it is to really simplify the message that you're telling to your market or your customer? Um, Marianne mentioned that sometimes she feels like the messages get a little too deep in the weeds and then they lose the impact that's really necessary. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's um, that's a really hard one, and I I think that overall you want to adjust the message to who you're talking to. If you are talking to an incredibly technical audience, then simplifying the message might not might not work as well. They might actually want to know the really nitty gritty details. They might actually want to go into the weeds. If you are talking to people that are at a much higher level or are much more interested in like the business impact of things, then you really want to make sure that that, that is covered. To, to sort of give you an example, going back to that cute little hummingbird logo, um, if I would talk to a, a developer, I would absolutely go into the weeds and talk about all those different types of apps and dive a bit more into detail on how that works internally, because that, that might actually matter to, to that person. Um, if I talk to like an architect, they might think it's interesting, but they also might be, okay, that's great for my developers, but how is it going to help me achieve this business problem? So it, it really all depends on who you're telling the story to. And it, that doesn't make it any easier, but that's, that's at least how I've seen it be successful. Awesome. Uh, we've got someone asking for some of your recommendations um, about how to stop thinking incrementally um, and start kind of moving towards radically different thought. Um, you gave an example about Apple moving from the iPod to the iPhone, right, rather than just increasing the, the size of the iPod. Um, do you have any suggestions for people that want to continue to foster that mental shift? So, um... One of the things that, that I've seen work in, uh, in, in different companies, and it, it, so it, it differs a bit how, how does companies call it, um, but at, at TIPCO, one of the, one of the things that we, we learned was to think about one big thing. So one of, the, one of the, like the most important roadmap item, if you will, was that one big thing. What is really going to change the way that people see the product? And that could be, uh, you know, something that like literally not existed. It could be a bit more incremental as well. But the idea was, let's get out of that comfort zone. Let's make sure that people understand that, you know, your product is different. It's growing to solve new problems. It's growing to be um, this, this new thing that really did not exist before. I love that. All right. Very last question, because we're at the top of the hour here. Uh, Dave wants to know where your accent is from. And I'm going to make a bargain. <laughs> I'm going to make a bargain on Dave's behalf. Dave, if Leon answers, you owe him a cheesecake recommendation. Um, so where is your accent from? <laughs> so my accent is, is Dutch. I was born and raised in the Netherlands and moved to the U.S. to the, the great state of California um, in, I think it was 2015. <laughs> And on that note, we will wrap up um, what has been an absolutely exceptional session. Thank you so much um, for all of your, uh, your generosity and your ideas and your insight. It's been a total blast hanging out with you. Thank you to everybody who joined us um, for being so engaged and fun uh, and responding to um, all of our uh, different games and prompts. You can connect with Leon on LinkedIn or, of course, uh, in Pragmatics alumni community. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Leon. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Until next time, we will talk to you soon.